They were cabbage salads, by the way, Katie, because after the great boycott, we went to a lettuce boycott. <laughs> you might not have known that, but that is where, it, that is the origin of the cabbage salad. And thank you, that's a perfect segue to one of the most effective global organizers in world history ever, Dolores Huerta. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve that title, but uh, I'm so happy to be here with the, the rest of us here to honor Blaise Pompeii. And uh, I was so fortunate uh, to not only know Blaise, but also to have him live in our neighborhood, which was at uh, La Paz in King, California. And uh, Blaise and Teresa uh, came there and uh, joined the $10 a week club. Uh, because in the farm worker movement, as many of you know, uh, we didn't receive wages or salaries. Everyone there, uh, we got, you know, we, the union took care of our medical expenses and uh, we had uh, food from food stamps. Uh, we had our clothes from donations. And uh, here, this incredible couple came there to join us and to live like the rest of us there. Well. Coming uh, from Latin America the way that they did, uh, and they were able to connect uh, the, the, the issues and what people were suffering in Latin America uh, with what the farm workers were suffering uh, here in California and the rest of the United States. So uh, Blaise brought with him his wisdom and uh, his knowledge, uh, his compassion, and I do want to say his courage. Uh, it was not an easy thing for them to do what they did and to stay there. Uh, they helped us publish our newspaper, El Malcriado, which in English means the naughty one. And uh, to be able to, uh, you know, inform everybody about what was going on. And of course, remember, but that was in the days before uh, we had Facebook and the internet. And so people, uh, there was just a lot of ignorance People did not really understand what was happening in Latin America. And this is what Blaise brought uh, to us at La Paz, but eventually, of course, we know uh, to the rest of the community here in Los Angeles. And uh, it was wonderful to have them there. It gave us a, a kind of an international feeling, which we did not have before they arrived uh, at the headquarters of United Farm Workers. And so we are eternally grateful uh, to Blaise uh, for bringing his understanding and his knowledge and to share that with us. And then we were very fortunate also because uh, their children were raised with my children. And uh, that, that bond of friendship uh, continues to this day. And uh, so we were also very grateful for that. So I feel really, uh, Teresa, that we are family. We are family, and I know that that bond of friendship and family will continue. And of course, the work also continues. The thing about Blaise Pompeii is he had this incredible courage. He was, as we all know, a very humble person. And uh, his whole life was about spreading justice and getting people to commit to justice the way that he did his entire life. So I would like to ask everybody here in the audience, uh, so. I know we did Presente a little while ago, but let's say a big O Viva for Blaise Pompeii. So, oh, I do want to add one other thing. You know, by, uh, I think that bond of friendship among our children was really uh, fixed forever uh, when they attended uh, Jane, and Jane Fonda and Tom Hayden's camp, where they were able to go there, uh, this incredible camp where uh, Jane and Tom were able to uh, bring the children of the farm workers, the children from the poor neighborhoods here in Los Angeles, uh, together with many of the very uh, uh, famous celebrities. And uh, they all uh, were able to share their experiences and learn from each other. So uh, I'm going to ask everybody to say a big old viva for Blaise Pompeii. So I'm going to say viva Blaise Pompeii, and everybody shout a big old viva. And let's do it three times, okay? Three times. Viva Blaise Pompeii! Viva, a little bit louder, okay? 
I mean, we really have to make the Raptors, you know, ring with, with his with his Viva. Viva Blaise Pompeii! Viva! Viva Blaise Pompeii! Viva! Viva! Muchas gracias. Thank you. To not give long introductions to these people is really counterintuitive. Picture me just saying this. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Kovic. Please come forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Teresa, we love you, and we stand with you today and every day to come. We are with you. Uh, Blaze um, was my brother, and he was my friend. Uh, we marched together, and uh, I was thinking today of all the different uh, places that we spoke at, and uh, I can't remember them all. But a couple of years ago, I was at the Long Beach Veterans Hospital, and I was very sick, very ill. I had pneumonia. And that had put me on the intensive care ward. And I could hardly breathe. I had never been in that situation before, other than in 1968, when I had been shot in Vietnam, and I was on the intensive care ward in Vietnam. And I was in and out of morphine every four hours, and uh, I had barely gotten off the battlefield alive. And I didn't know whether I was going to make it through that week. Well, there I was, back in that same place again. And I, um, in those moments when I was trying to breathe and just stay alive, um, I thought of Blaze, and I, I wanted to ask a friend to have him come down. And the last time I had received last rites of the Catholic Church was in Vietnam after I had been wounded. And I never told Blaze this, but I wanted him to come down and give me the last rites of the Catholic Church. But I kept putting it off because I, I didn't want to die, I wanted to live. He was a beautiful man and a brilliant man. And uh, as I said, uh, he was my friend. Um, I loved him and I will always love him. The days uh, ahead will be difficult and uh, I believe that we may have to go to the streets again in this country in great numbers. And it really doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're in a wheelchair or whether you're walking with that cane as Blaze did. I can remember a demonstration against the war when he walked by my side and he could hardly walk and he held on to the back handle of my wheelchair to steady him. But that, that day and those days are coming up ahead. And regardless of how tired we might be, and we've been there before, we've marched and we've demonstrated, we are going to have to do that again. And we're going to have to bring young people with us, students with us, great numbers of people with us. That's how this society is going to change. All the people are going to come together because they're going to know that a grave, grave injustice has been done. And it must be rectified. It must be changed. And the only way that it can be changed is by the people coming together, uniting together, and understanding that the greatest strength we have is being together as a community, committed to peace, committed to nonviolence, committed to a more beautiful society. What was it that Dr. Martin Luther King called the a community that he was striving for? The beloved community. 
I believe in my heart, regardless of all the darkness, that there is light ahead, that there is a beloved community waiting for all of us. And it, it wasn't long ago that we were all together honoring Blaze uh, when he retired from KPFK. What was it? Just a few months ago. And he was just a few feet away from me. And I looked over at him and I was, I was re remembering uh, all the different things that, that had happened. I, uh, the Wally George show. You know, he was so sensitive and so loving and caring. He had such compassion, so gentle, you know, like a kitten almost. But he had a fierce temper too. And it was a righteous temper. He had a right to be angry because he knew some terrible things were happening. And he had to fight. He was a fighter, and he had to fight back. And I remember one of the things I said uh, a couple of months ago was that we will march again, and we will march to change this country. And I said, even though, you know, I could tell his health was failing, I just saw a strong man sitting there, and I said, you will be with us, and he will be with us when we march this next time. He will be marching with us, and he will be marching right up front. Because he was, he was such a strong presence in our lives. And that's why we're all here today, because he touched our lives profoundly, profoundly, in a way that most people never do. And that's why when we change this country, and we will, we will change this country. And when we move forward, and we will move forward, he will be marching with us. And we will feel that spirit as strongly as anything you can imagine. God bless you, Teresa. God bless, Tra uh, God bless Blaze. And God bless our beautiful country. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. That was beautiful. Now I get to introduce someone who is a great colleague and teacher of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Jim Lawson. Please welcome. Well, so many things, good things have been said so far, and true things, and things that we all must take to heart and ponder over and reflect upon them for a long time to come. I wanted to be here, Teresa, because, because you and Blaze are in a part of my generation of people who've worked across the decades, uh, the decade of Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin King, and Bill Coffin and Abraham Joshua Heschel, and Leonard Berman, just an extraordinary set of people who well, the last seven or eight or nine decades have tried to set the pace to help us see in the midst of the meandering tyrannies of our society uh, the way forward and the way towards becoming a people who could declare and could insist that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal, and that all are endowed with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we are not here to 
mourn. We are here to celebrate a life, a magnificent life, a compassionate life, a courageous life, a life that was in the pathway for demonstrating to all of us what it means to be human and what it means to be whole and what it means to love and serve. The story of Blaise and Teresa is a wonderful story. There are other folk that I've known across the years uh, who uh, emulated them or who they inspired or who also maybe supported them. They are a part of the spiritual moral revolution within Christianity, in which we've known that the dogmas of Christianity, the dogmas of USA social, cultural, religious, religiosity does not represent either the height or the depth or the width or the length of the Creator's concern for us in the gift of life or the Creator's concern for our society as a whole. So I want primarily to lift up this. Ron Kovic has said it in his way, and it's important for us to hear what he said. But I want simply to indicate that if we're genuine about celebrating this life, and it was always my pleasure and privilege to be in Blaze's company across the last 40 odd years here in Los Angeles. But if we want to mourn our loss and the severing of our community by his death, we must therefore celebrate his life by continuing and intensifying the soul force struggle for the soul of this nation. Uh, and I do not care how many times any of us have been to jail or how many times any of us have been in so many different campaigns. Uh, I do care, but I don't care how many times we have marched or sat in or picketed or engaged on strikes and the rest of it. Uh, in this huge gathering of sisters and brothers, we must in continue the struggle and intensify the struggle. There is... <clears throat> <clears throat> All is not lost. Ron is absolutely correct. The times may get worse before they're going to get better. We have no na coherent national platform <laughs> for, for us being. Uh, united people of truth and justice. We have no national leadership for saying that this USA empire has got to dissolve itself and become a people in the midst of this human race, not a policeman of the world, not the exceptional to human sin, but a people who understand humbly before the Creator that we must indeed repent of the way in which we as a people have allowed our nation to grow and to become. <clears throat> that we cannot continue to go in the direction of the powers that be of our land 
or the power brokers, either economically or socially or culturally or politically or even religiously, that unless somehow our land can see how many millions of our own people struggle with life with not that much support from the society, we will not, as a people, survive. This empire must be dismantled. <clears throat> this, man, this empire must be dismantled from within. And Ron is correct. If we would honor this afternoon's subject, his life and his continuing living, then you and I must, more than ever before, commit ourselves to the continuing struggle. And we must intensify that struggle and make it in truth, a struggle for love and compassion, for justice, for the unity of the human race. We must do it with strategic power. We must do it selecting the priorities that can most strike at the poison we have for too long been drinking. We must do it in a fashion that we try to bring together, as Gandhi and King and many others have done, bring together human history that shows us how violence can be met with truth and injustice can be met with justice and economic ex exploitation and making human beings things can be met by insisting and demanding that we are all the children of the universe and the children of God and that we can learn to live in the light of that kind of eternity. And so let us not, let us not allow this time together where so much has been read and said already. Let us permit the Creator to move us each inwardly. And as friends and sisters and brothers of Teresa and Blaze, commit ourselves to the continuing struggle and to the intensification of that struggle of soul force and truth force so that indeed our nation under God might become truly free and truly alive, not just for us alone, but for every boy and every girl, every man, every woman, all over our land. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reverend Lawson.